So welcome back to uh, Wednesday afternoon. This session is called uh, Theoretical DBs. Let me start with a brief discussion of the general background and developments, also pointing at some topics we may discuss in the final discussion section. There has been significant uh, discussion about uh, what people call open data and open access to knowledge in the sciences and humanities, and data sharing is part of that. When we think about basic science, this sounds to be, I think, an obvious concept. And I would say it's simply good scientific practice. Um, scientific research should be uh, described fully and honestly so that studies can be reproduced and advanced by others. Now, researchers typically sign even a document uh, that they, they sign that there's consent to these concepts when they accept money from funding agencies. And uh, everyone knows that data without comprehensive characterization and annotation, annotation, these data are useless also for themselves after some months and even more so for others. So the problem is not new and it has been discussed since decades. Uh, I just quote here an editorial from Nature from 2017, but it's actually much older in principle. Most of this discussion is just, as they say, empty rhetoric. And to some extent that is still true. And they say government funders and scientific communities must move beyond lip service and commit to data sharing practices and platforms. Now, I'm not a friend of rules of governments by government or funders, but I'm even less a friend of lip service. So uh, there's something uh, we have to do. And I think it's very nice to see that the at least computational science community has moved pretty well in this, uh, uh, this direction, but there's actually much more to do. The key question still is, why should people do this? Obviously, being a good person, in Germany, we would say you being a good mensch, um, uh, is not enough motivation. The critical importance of data collection and sharing has been well recognized since the early times of science. And um, the example by Tycho Brahe and, and, and Johannes Kepler is just somewhat typically uh, typical what we still see to some extent today. The former, that means Tycho Brahe, had comprehensively and accurately measured astron astronomic data. Brahe had the best data uh, at the time, but he guarded them very carefully. He did not share. Only late in his life, he invited Johannes Kepler as an assistant Brahe's untimely death in 1601, about only one year after Kepler's arrival, was in fact a big help for Kepler, since this gave him relatively free access to Tycho Brahe's data. Some people, in fact, argued that Kepler has stolen the data. Then after Brahe's death, based on his data, Kepler developed what is known as the laws of planetary motion. And based on that, Isaac Newton really developed his important rules and laws. Obviously, uh, that shows actually how important data sharing is, but it's also clear that it should be different than in this example. Um, and here is a summary of uh, data projects and facilities compiled in 2019 by uh, Lauri Himanen et al. And I only added, uh, in fact, one point um, here on, on on this thing. Uh, the idea was put forward for, uh, to create a comprehensive data repository was put forward in 1882 by Hans Heinrich Landold and Richard Bernstein, both professors at the Agriculture College in Berlin, when signing a contract with the publisher Ferdinand Springer to print a book, Physikalik, of, uh, in English, Physical Chemical Tables. Um, this endeavor has been growing enormously since then, and it's now known as the Landolt Bernstein or Springer Materials. By now, these are several hundred books with several hundred thousand pages covering data on uh, mechanical, optical, acoustical, 
thermal, spectroscopic, electrical, magnetic properties, and more. These are the most, these are mostly experimental data from the literature curated by experts and editors in material science. Gradually, also data from numerical simulations are now being included. And only recently, Springer started the development of a digital online version. Since 1962, um, the number of data repositories in material science moved towards digitalization. So this is a time axis here below. And so in 60, uh, 1960, Say, 1965, not 62. 1965, um, that is the start of the Cambridge Structural Database, CSD. Uh, in early 1970, the next uh, CALFAT calculation of phase diagrams database was developed, and numerous other databases really have been established, as you see on this axis, since then. In the field of electronic structure theory, the key or biggest developments are. AFLOW, Materials Project, um, OQMD, and, uh, oops, sorry, this was too fast, and, 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 and NOMAD. Um, the red ones will be presented this afternoon. The blue one, the material project is missing today, but uh, tomorrow Anubhav Yain will talk about it. And uh, the green one, Marvel or Aida, will be covered tomorrow by Giovanni Pizzi. But much of what you see today will in fact not describe the databases, but the talks today will be more on data analytics. So considering, but tomorrow you will see in fact the, the, the database aspects uh, in, in, in more depth, I think. Considering the about 100 atoms of the periodic table, and that is somewhat the motivation behind most of the work, uh, the elements and all the possibilities of mixing these atoms and all pos in all possible structures and all unit cell sizes implies that the number of uh, all possible materials is practically infinite. And this implies that it's very likely that materials exist that we don't know so far and that have novel properties or that have a performance in their function which is better than that of the materials we know today. Or it may be that some materials or some material properties are there of materials which we know, but we don't know the properties. Um, so how can we find these exceptional materials, right? I mean, th th there is uh, an enormous number of, of possibilities, but not so many are really, say, have, showing a high performance. So, High throughput screening will be will help us a lot in getting really relevant data, but in view of the sheer size of the chemical and structural space of materials, this direct information will remain very insufficient. The daunting challenge for artificial intelligence for material science is that practically in, that in this practically infinite space, the interesting materials are very rare. These are the high performance materials with high performance functions are statistically exceptional. To find structure in the data, hopefully also finding materials with exceptional performance, we are using machine learning or more general artificial intelligence methods or very broadly speaking, data analytics. And our first speaker will address this. This is James Kermode. Uh, from the School of Engineering at the University of Warwick. There he's also associated with the EPSRC Center of Doctoral Training and Modeling of Hydrogen Systems and with the Center of Predictive Modeling where he's a co-director. And for us, importantly, he's also an important PI in the NOMAD Novel Materials Discovery Center of Excellence. Uh, he's talking about upcoming developments for big data analytics in NOMAD. I show staring, sharing and I'm looking forward uh, to your talk, uh, James. Great, thanks a lot, Matthias. Let me go ahead and share my screen.